I've, I've known Peter for a really long time, actually, so I'm really delighted to give a, a lecture that's named after him. He's, he's a huge inspiration for a, a lot of our work and also a, a, just a terrific uh, scientist and person. So I'm going to be telling you a little bit today about some of our work, um, mostly concentrating around the design of nanomaterial systems for quite a wide range of different applications. And um, the work in our group really spans from uh, some very fundamental work, which is about understanding the principles behind some of the materials that we design and really characterizing them, uh, right through to applications and, and very much looking at how we can design uh, new therapies and new interventions that can help people, including uh, people really uh, across the, the, the globe in, in different uh, parts of society. So uh, this is all thanks to a, a fantastic multidisciplinary and, and multinational group uh, of uh, people. Um, I don't do any of the lab work myself anymore, um, but I'm really privileged to lead this fantastic group, um, many of whom have gone on to professorships. About 50 of our alumni now are uh, independent uh, academics, and many have also set up uh, great spin-out companies. So, so this kind of multidisciplinary approach uh, enables us to do uh, science, which is at the interface of a number of different disciplines. And the applications are rather broad, but actually the, the, the core of what we do is about understanding the biomaterial interface and designing this for different applications and also characterizing it with new types of methodologies. So I'm going to show you uh, some examples today of some of the things that we do um, in the work of um, uh, sort of therapeutics area and, and also uh, in disease detection. And underlying that will be some of the characterization methods, um, including ones that we've invented within the group when we've been um, uh, not able to uh, get enough information from uh, techniques that are conventionally available. So, um, very, very simply put, and obviously uh, an extremely obvious statement, uh, there is a, a massive clinical need for therapeutics. And I'm sure that many people watching this webinar um, are deeply motivated by uh, working on therapeutic strategies and also designing nanomaterial systems to impact in different um, areas. And we, we really are um, about the platforms that we design. So, so many of the systems we design can be applied in a number of different material systems. And, and one of those areas is, is, is thinking uh, also about therapeutics for regenerative medicine. Um, and um, a lot of our early work was in designing uh, 3D biomaterial scaffolds, for example, that could interact with cells in interesting ways. Um, and one of the things that uh, I realized very early on was that um, you, of course, have very different levels of complexity that you can en engineer into your material systems, but um, that complexity is, is really a double-edged sword because it can be used to give more information to the cells, but on occasion it can also make uh, materials more, more difficult to translate. Um, but it's really, really important that when we design material systems, we think about um, the end translational goals so that um, we can make sure they're translated in, in safe uh, and effective ways. And, and that image that you can see on the top right is, is actually a material system from Medtronic, Medtronic that some of you will know. Uh, it's a product called Infuse that has a collagen sponge in the uh, center. Uh, which is or collagen biomaterial in the center, uh, which uh, delivers very high doses of a, um, a bone stimulating uh, growth factor. Um, and actually the delivery of that growth factor is, is, is in too high doses compared to what's physiologically uh, normally available and, and leads to side effects. So, so we, we want to really think about delivering the right kind of signals, but in the right sort of concentrations and the right sort of temporal uh, features. And this, this requires a lot of uh, engineering. So, so to do that, we also want to understand about tissue structure as much as possible. And um, in one of our recent studies, you can see here, uh, we really zoomed into the, the nanoscale structure of bone. And I'll keep going, um, going into different details of, of nanoscale throughout this whole talk. And what we were able to, to show in this very fundamental paper um, in, in science recently, was that actually that organization between the mineral and the non-mineral phases of uh, bone architecture was slightly different to what people had previously thought. 
And we were also able to redefine the different levels of hierarchy within the organization of the bone. And for someone like myself who'd been working on bone tissue regeneration for uh, well, well over a, a, a decade, um, this kind of fundamental study of the bone architecture was really, really inspiring actually in terms of thinking about how we can then design better biomaterial systems. We're also really interested fundamentally in thinking about how cells interact with surfaces. Um, so uh, for example, this might be chemistry on a surface or, or topography, um, uh, mechanical forces and so on, obviously really important as well. Um, and it's that sort of fundamental study of how cells interact with surfaces that I find really fascinating and that can also help us to then design better biomaterial systems. So I'm going to show you quite a fundamental uh, study again. I'm starting off with some of our slightly more fundamental work and I'll then move into really applied examples. Um, this was a fundamental study where um, we knew that uh, previous work by other groups, for example, Chris Chen and Don, Don Ingberg had shown for um, many years that if you had um, uh, stem cells uh, arranged in different shapes, it could actually um, um, influence their differentiation into different lineages. And so, for example, a, a round um, stem cell on a surface would become more fat-like and a triangle one more, more bone-like, and it's even though they have the same contact area. And this, this to me was really, really fascinating. And there was some information about why this happened, but, but the full story wasn't yet uncovered. So what we wanted to do was to pattern cells, single cells, stem cells um, in different shapes and to actually study that interface between the cell and the material. But to study it in a way that hadn't been done before. So to really, really zoom in, look at it in nanoscale level of detail and understand what's happening at that interface. And so, so we patterned our cells and we developed imaging uh, protocols that enabled us to do that imaging whilst preserving the ultra structure resolution of the cell um, and to then look at that interface um, using um, algorithms that we developed to be able to, um, to resolve that interface and, and actually visualize it. So you can see here one of the um, circle um, base cells um, and that's that interface there at the nano scale it's rather fat so so that cell that's more likely to become fat like when it differentiates has this sort of flat interface but if in contrast you then look at the uh, triangle uh, cell so this one is more likely to become bone like and if we look at it at the same resolution you can see it's now a lot more bumpy. Um, and so even though it's got the same contact area, the way that cell is interacting is completely different on the surface. And um, you can see this in these false color resolution images here, that the triangle one at the top has got all of these uh, invaginations on the membrane. And you can quantify that. And there's really quite significant differences. Um, in the end, we, this was coupled with a lot of biochemistry uh, measurements as well, and, and we were able to uncover some signaling pathways that helped to explain a little bit uh, what was happening with these different differentiation processes. But, but really, I wanted to show this as an illustrative example that you can apply the kinds of techniques actually that had been used in different fields in material science and apply these to biology with some modifications and start to get um, some really new insight into um, how cells interact with material systems. Now, um, we are very interested in translation, um, and I'm delighted to serve currently as the director of the UK Regenerative Medicine Programme Smart Materials Hub. And this brings together 10 different universities across the UK, um, all developing three-dimensional material systems to um, regenerate different tissues within the body. We have a particular focus on musculoskeletal um, and the eye and also the liver. Um, and what's quite unusual about this hub is that we're thinking of translation right from the outset. And we have commercial and regulatory panels, manufacturing um, advisory panels, and also safety and immunology consultants really embedded throughout all of our hub uh, structure. And all of our early career researchers also get training uh, in terms of that translational um, pathway. So, so we are um, working very heavily in this area in the design of uh, material systems. And there's a, a number of clinical trials actually starting now um, uh, associated with, with our hub. 
But um, I wanted to tell you about something slightly different today, which is one of our technologies, which is complementary to that work that's going on in the hub. And it's actually a technology um, that we developed to help us to understand um, some of the different um, delivery systems that we might be using in regenerative medicine, but also for other therapeutic applications. And there are many, many nanoscale delivery systems. So you'll, um, many of you on the call will be uh, familiar with these, perhaps working with some of these. I've just pulled out there on the right um, a few of our really recent papers just from the last couple of years with some of these different classes of nanomedicines. I wanted to point actually to Anna Blackney's um, paper because she's also uh, now moved to University of Vancouver as one of your fantastic new um, academics. And she was a postdoc with us in London previously. Um, and really what we have is an interest in studying these nanomedicines to better understand uh, what is happening with them and their heterogeneity and their sort of chemistry. And to do that, um, we invented a new methodology. In fact, a new instrument, a completely new technique. This is called SPARTA. This is single particle automated Raman trapping analysis. Um, and this is um, currently being uh, uh, commercialized. And this is a technique that enables us to do something that we couldn't previously do, and that we were really, really uh, excited and eager to try. And this enables us to trap individual nanoparticles, so related, for example, to a nanomedicine, and to study their composition and their chemistry, um, relate this, for example, to their size, and also to study dynamic changes on those particles on an individual particle basis in an automated way. So you can actually study um, large populations of nanoparticles, but deconvolve a single particle information and uncover some of that heterogeneity that you would never be able to uncover from bulk measurements. And the way we do this, we have our own uh, coding and software that's all been developed. We can trap our particles, uh, and if they're successfully uh, trapped, and this is all based on um, uh, some of the coding that we have, then we go on to acquire a high signal to noise acquisition. Um, and uh, this is now um, actually a, a fully, um, uh, fully prototyped uh, instrument, uh, which is in, in, in a box and, and rather user friendly at this uh, stage. So if people are interested in acquiring uh, some of this or collaborating, please, please get in touch. And I'll show, show you some of the things it can do. Um, this was our first paper on it uh, back a couple of years ago. Um, it's actually invented by um, Yelit Penders and Isaac Pence and, and um, myself. So two, two of our wonderful researchers um, in the group. And um, what we're looking at here is uh, on the top, two different types of liposomes. Some are deuterated in the red there uh, and the others aren't. And you can um, put, put that mixture within the Sparta system and you can de deconvolute uh, the different signatures and, and, and pull those out without having to label your particles. Um, in the bottom example, we've got two different types of polymer-based particles. The ones in um, blue have an extra heparin group along the backbone, and again, you can pull that out from the Raman uh, spectral signature without having to label um, these particle systems. And you can correlate that to the size of the particle. Um, the way you do that is that um, you put a Raman active solution mark marker in, um, and when the particle comes into the trap, it displaces it. And so you can uh, essentially um, relate that to the volume uh, that the particle is occupying. And you can find actually some really interesting uh, trends uh, between the sort of chemistry of the particles and, and the volume for different formulations and, and things like that. And also um, really at the same time measure the drug loading, for example, um, and how proteins might be adhering to the surface uh, of the um, particle. I don't have data on that here, but those are the sort of uh, measurements that we're, we're making. And then the, the final thing I just want to show as an example uh, is something I'm very excited about, which is the fact that you can actually trap individual particles and then you can measure real time changes in their chemistry. So in this particular case, we have a polystyrene nanoparticle um, <clears throat> and we first of all have an alkyne uh, um, group introduced on it and then we convert this to a triazole group and you can actually follow the change of those chemical peaks in um, real time 
uh, for individual particles and also for bulk measurements and see how those things um, differ. So if you're interested in looking at how particles would change over time, I think this is a really, really exciting um, way to do that. Um, the way we see this fitting in um, is, is once you've discovered your active ingredient or, or, or viral vector, depending on, on what you're working um, on, um, we would be able to come in um, to help with delivery formulation development, um, also uh, throughout the manufacturing process development to really understand uh, the intricacies uh, of uh, differences within formulations that might ultimately affect functionality. Um, and then also down the line as a sort of um, a, um, a quality control uh, within your um, manufacturing uh, process. So um, please, please do get in touch if this, is, um, if this is interesting to you. And it's now been validated in um, many different systems. Uh, a lot of these papers are actually currently in press and um, should be out uh, very shortly, I hope. Um, but we've shown this works really well with different types of viral uh, vectors, a number of different viral vectors. Uh, we also have some work on exosomes coming out very shortly, um, as well as a whole range of different lipid-based particles and polymer-based particles and um, also interesting things like uh, cubosomes. Um, and some of the things we're interested in are, are, are the composition and functionalization, but also really that degree of payload, you know, particularly for things like viral vectors, where this can be really heterogeneous, to trying to understand that a little bit more in an in a easy measurement um, approach is, is really interesting to us. Um, and also thinking about how could we use this approach to tell us about maybe contamination within a sample um, and stabilities of samples over time and, and so on. Um, and these, these are just some of the things that will be out uh, very shortly in the literature. So a little bit more work um, on some of the uh, lipid-based systems, in, including um, some, some cubosome work and um, some different work also coming through on polymer-based particles and exosomes. So um, keep, keep your eyes peeled. These, these papers should be out um, hopefully very shortly. And please do get in touch if you think um, this could be interesting as a, um, a collaborative tool for you because we're very keen to validate this in as many different systems as possible. Okay, so um, the other thing that I'm kind of um, very excited about is thinking about different ways that we can achieve drug delivery um, and um, therapeutic delivery um using using engineering um so so we've done quite a bit of work using light to activate um uh, therapeutic delivery including actually some recent work on light to activate uh, crispr um within um uh, zebrafish systems um but i'm not going to talk about that today we've also done a lot of work on um, ultrasound um, and using that to achieve gelation of materials and, and drug delivery um, what I'm going to talk about today is actually a more of a mechanical approach to achieving um, drug delivery and in particular thinking about how we can use nanostructured uh, needles and uh, materials to help with delivery of um, cargo. Um, and I think really um, the other thing that we can do is actually use these kind of material systems to probe what's happening within living cells. And that's a really exciting thing to be able to do. This um, picture here just gives you an overview of some of the um, nanoscale um, or nanotechnology enabled approaches that are currently available in the field to interact with um, uh, cells and to, to measure uh, some of the things happening intracellularly. And so you can see there's a number of very uh, fancy tools that have been used and applied, for example, um, glass nanopipettes or hollow AFM tips and even carbon nanotubes uh, can be used to uh, essentially sequester very small amounts of intracellular um, uh, medium and, and to measure this um, to, to get some idea of um, uh, different molecules that are um, uh, within the cell. These are uh, really nice in terms of the, uh, the advances in nanotechnology that have enabled these, but they're um, by definition a little bit uh, low throughput and also uh, quite difficult to apply in vivo. 
Uh, there's also a much higher throughput approach, which is called a nanostraw approach from Stanford, which is, um, in my opinion, really beautiful technology. Um, and this is uh, great for some in vitro uh, applications um, and uh, um, uh, less so in, 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 in vivo currently. So, so we wanted to complement this really nice work from um, uh, all these other groups and um, come up with an approach that could be high throughput, but also uh, really in, easy to translate in vivo. And the work that we did, um, this was um, developed um, in collaboration with HMRI, was to develop um, platforms of very small needles. And you can tell they're very small because what you can see in this image here is a single cell uh, on their surface. And so you'll get um, you know, somewhere between 50 and 100 of these needles per individual cell. Um, and they can interact with the cell in a really close, close manner to enable us to both deliver things to the cell, but also measure things that are happening within the cell. Um, if you're interested in this area, I'd um, uh, refer you to um, uh, Stuart Higgins's uh, recent um, overview paper, which, which gives a really good background to um, some of the ways both our group, but also other groups in the field um, have developed uh, nanostructured interfaces for uh, both uh, biomechanical uh, stimulation of cells, but also uh, measuring cells, what's happening within cells, and also bioelectronic um, in interfacing as well for stimulation and sensing. Um, we are doing a lot on the bioelectronic side, but I, I, I won't talk about that uh, today. I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about how we use these to deliver, but also to sense what's happening within cells. Um, our first, first work on this was um, published a few years ago in um, Nature Materials, and that was using a, a conventional um, microfab approach with a, a new kind of metal-assisted chemical etch to, to generate needles. And what we've done over time is to really refine that process to achieve better control over the geometry, but also to open up the processing so that we can make these needles out of many, many different material types. Um, uh, including also um, uh, polymer-based uh, materials. So um, we have um, now many different platforms uh, that we make these from, and you can really control the architecture in terms of um, how uh, pointy they are, for example, how spaced they are, what size they are. You have really pretty much full control over those things. Um, and this just shows you um, a uh, focused ion beam reconstruction um, that um, actually Yele Penders has done of a cell on these nano needles. And um, what you can see um, um, here, uh, this is actually from a different cell, but it's, it's the same thing, is, is a reconstruction where you can see that the, the needle interacts very closely uh, with the cell, inside of the cell in green. Um, but the nucleus, which is uh, in this particular image shown in blue, um, actually uh, gets moved out the way. So it doesn't get penetrated by the needle. Um, it, it moves out the way um, and um, the, the needle itself um, interacts very closely uh, with the inside of the cell. And I'll give you a bit more details of how we've studied that um, in a minute. So we've use this to deliver many different things now over time. Um, many different types of molecules, small cargo, larger cargo. Um, this was actually from, from the first paper that we um, published. And this was delivering VEGF165 plasma DNA to muscle. Um, and what you can just see here is some of the new blood vessels that have formed a couple of weeks after um, delivering um, that vascular endothelial growth factor um, 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 encoding plasmin. So, so, and that was really just a demonstration that this sort of platform could be useful um, in vivo. But you can also use it in vitro for uh, transfecting uh, hard to transfect cells and uh, for a number of different um, applications as well. What I was really keen on, and you can see this paper actually appeared a few years after our sort of functional demonstration that these systems work. Um, I was really keen on, on getting, getting into deeper understanding of the mechanism of what was going on because people um, 
Um, actually, I'm not sure how many other people were interested in this, but I was really interested in this. Um, and so I uh, had a brilliant student, Sahana Gopal, who um, specialized in high resolution imaging. And what she did was to really zoom in to that interface between the needles in the cell in higher um, detail than we'd previously done. And when she did that, she was able to um, discover a few different things. Firstly, she discovered the cell membrane was still there but um, it was experiencing more um, uh, invaginations than it would normally do. Um, and if she looked, for example, at Catherine Pitts and Cavioli, and she found that um, that um, uh, cell membrane had many, many more of these if the cell was on a nano needle structured surface relative to a uh, flat surface. And um, this was really interesting to us because it helped to explain why these cells become um, more receptive to taking up material um, and also um, uh, why we could potentially uh, use, use these systems to measure things going on within the cell. And this was then complemented really nicely by work from Alexis, who was one of our um, brilliant PhD students who worked uh, for a while with uh, Alfredo Alexander Katz at MIT. Um, and Alfredo is a superb um, uh, modeler. And, and what um, Alexis did with him was to um, simulate surfaces that had different uh, nanoporosity on the surface and different sort of curvature of those nanopores and found that actually, depending on how you nanostructure that surface, you can really change the packing between the lipids in a cell membrane, which, is, which makes sense, but it was nice to see this um, uh, correlated to these um, um, simulations. And, and from that, we were able to um, essentially uh, relate the sort of um, per higher permeability that we were seeing within the membrane to perhaps the nanostructured interface that um, we had on the surface of our nanoneedles. Um, and Heijong has gone on um, to, to make many different types of these needles. Uh, they all have really interesting different mechanotransduction uh, properties, also some uh, influences on how cells differentiate. And if you're interested in that, I'd urge you to, to look up some of her, her beautiful recent work. Now we can also um, use these uh, needles for biosensing. Um, and one of the things we were interested in is thinking about how we can um, interface uh, these needles with um, uh, cancer cells and can we perhaps measure differences between cancer cells and healthy cells. We know there's really difference, a lot of differences in pH and also in intracellular enzymatic um, activity, so we wanted to look at both of these things. Um, and what Chiro did um, was to um, look at some OB, uh, 33 cells from the um, uh, cancerous cells from the esophagus and to um, map them with the nanoneedles um, with a, a functionalization of the nanoneedles that made them responsive, um, have a different fluorescence to different, um, uh, different pH uh, ranges. So, so we could, by doing this, we could actually tell at many different points throughout the cell what the exact pH of that a particular needle was. And this revealed a lot of interesting differences between cancerous cells and non-cancerous cells, but also has a lot of application in terms of thinking of live cell monitoring when you expose cells to interesting stimulation to see how that can affect um, the intracellular um, pH. And you can see the outline of the cells there in red on the left and, and the um, the sort of redder looking needles are inside the cell and the, the more green and yellow ones are, are outside. Um, we also mapped uh, intracellular enzyme activity. Um, in particular, we were interested in a protease called cathepsin B. This is upregulated in cancer cells. Um, so we functionalized the needles with short peptides that had a fluorophore on the end and those peptides could be specifically cleaved by this protease. Um, and then we applied this to um, real human tissue that had been taken from uh, cancer patients after surgery. And um, uh, with a fantastic surgeon called George uh, Hanna, who's actually one of the best um, surgeons in the UK for this. And what we were able to see is that this area um, at the top there that's lighting up bright red had a higher enzyme activity uh, than the other. And this helped us to identify uh, within these patients the tumor um, margins. The cell nuclei I had just shown in blue there, just so you know where the cells are. And you're down to more or less single cell resolution uh, of this difference in enzyme activity. 
Um, and, and finally, in this sort of um, earlier work that we did, um, we were interested in delivering nanoparticles, so slightly larger than um, individual molecules, um, but still quite small. Um, and what we uh, did here um, was to load the nano needles with um, quantum dots. These are CAD selenide zinc sulfide quantum dots. Um, and then interface the nanoneedles with cells. And what we found was that the um, nanoparticles um, are in the needles. You can see them the top left there, they show up white in the electron microscopy. And they um, are in the needles, but they also get out um, into the cell. Whereas if you have empty needles on the top right and you just drop the nanoparticles on the surface, they don't get in anywhere near as efficiently. And you can see that reflected and at the bottom in the fluorescence microscopy results as well. Now, the reason I was excited about this is, is that our group was the first group to use quantum dots for uh, biosensing of kinase and acetyl transferase um, enzyme activities. Um, and this, this new approach here using the needles is the first time that we can really optimize the way that these uh, kinds of particles could now get into cells. And previously we'd just been using the particles for in vitro drug uh, screening activity. So, so that really brings me to the final bit of my um, talk, which is thinking about how we can use nanoparticles uh, for biosensing. And this is a huge area of my group. Um, a, a, probably a third of my group is, is working in this area. Um, and it comes really, uh, again, from this deep motivation of wanting to understand that biomaterial interface. And in particular, um, to think about how we can control the functionalization of nanoparticle systems with different molecules to enable us to do biosensing of really interesting biomarkers. So I'll tell you a little bit about that in the last um, part of my um, talk. <clears throat> and because we're um, talking about platform technologies in a lot of the work that we do, we can apply this in many different areas. And I really see the work that we do um, having key important applications in infectious disease, and I'll mention a bit about that later, um, but also um, in diseases like cardiovascular. So looking, for example, at early heart failure or, or, or different heart events that might be happening. And of course, in uh, diseases like um, uh, cancer. So all of these diseases can really benefit from early detection. And this is the, the thing that we're really driven by. How can we use these nanomaterial systems to enable better early detection so that ultimately our patients can be better treated? The nanoparticles I'm gonna be talking about are inorganic, so a little bit different um, to some of the uh, more organic systems we use for our drug delivery. Um, and, and I think they're really, really exciting for many reasons, but also they're historically uh, have been around for a while. Um, so if you look at this example here, this is a Lycurgus cup. This is from the fourth century AD. Um, it's in the British Museum. So next time you come to London, check it out. It's really, really cool. Um, and if you shine a light inside it, it looks red. And if you shine a light at it, it looks green. And that is because the wall of that cup has very small gold nanoparticles in there. And so gold nanoparticles interact with light in really, really interesting ways. And this is the same for many other types of um, inorganic and plasmonic nanoparticles that I'm gonna be talking about. And um, we think about using these nanoparticles in different ways. Um, I really view our expertise as being um, working with and a number of different um, nanoparticle materials. Um, so it could be plasmonic particles, could be some polymer-based particles um, or, or, or some other uh, particles. We really work with a large range, but it's really that um, uh, functionalization of that biointerface and that characterization that enables us to do uh, fantastic uh, biosensing. And we can use this for drug screening uh, and in research tools, but we can also use it for early disease detection. And that's the examples I'll tell you about today. I also want to give a big shout out to my collaborator, Irene Yarovsky, who does all the molecular dynamics uh, that informs uh, much of the work that we do um, experimentally. So it's really complementary to our experimental results. And this is one of her uh, simulations you can see on the right. So, um, 
one, one of the biosensing uh, approaches that we've recently developed um, is about helping us to detect early cancer in the body faster. And it's essentially a urine test and the urine test will turn blue if you have um, upregulated markers related to cancer. And the kind of molecules we're interested in detecting are proteases. And these are often um, upregulated in uh, different inflammatory states, including um, some uh, specific ones for some cancers. And um, the assay itself, I'll take a minute to talk through it because it's, um, it has different components. Um, we have a carrier protein. In this case, this is uh, the protein Nutravidin. This is about eight nanometers in diameter, top left, you can see. Um, and then this can bind to four biotin groups. And the biotin groups are on the end of peptide linkers that have a very small gold nanocluster at the other um, end of the peptide. And the whole um, assembly is about 11 nanometers. So if you inject this into um, the mouse, um, it is too big to come out through the um, kidney in, in that assembled form. However, if you have an upregulation of the protease related to the cancer, it can cleave through those peptide chains. And then these very tiny gold nanoclusters that are only about two nanometers are small enough to come out um, through the kidney into the urine. And they, we can then add some chemicals um, that enable them to um, undergo a reaction that turns the urine uh, blue. They act essentially as artificial um, enzymes. Uh, they're rather um, um, nice in the way we can make them. This is all led by Colleen uh, Loinaken, um, and this was a collaboration with the Batia Lab um, at MIT. And we can make them in a what, what make the 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 system um, in a one pot uh, synthesis where uh, we can control that peptide. So you can see just some examples here: some control enzymes like thrombin, uh, the protease we're interested in, which is called matrix metalloprotease nine. Um, and then also you can change the number of um, amino acid spaces and things like that to really optimize enzyme access and, and the way that these things work. Um, and I'm cutting a, a sort of very long short, story short, but um, we did in vivo uh, validation of this in um, uh, Sangeeta Batia's um, lab with the uh, mouse model that they have for colorectal cancer. And what you can see is that in the healthy mice, the urine stays uh, yellow. And in the um, uh, mice with the, um, um, the cancer uh, model, the urine uh, goes to, to this kind of striking blue color. Um, and this is very early work, very um, still, still in the small animal uh, model at the moment, but we're really interested to see how we can take this forward um, to different disease applications and also different models. Um, then the final thing I want to tell you about is something that's probably been on, on many people's minds, actually, is a, a little bit about infectious disease um, detection. And we were working on this for uh, pre-COVID for, for, for many years. It's been a, a huge um, passion of mine. Um, and, and particularly because um, infectious disease really disproportionately affects low-income countries. And I um, truly truly believe um, that in our role as engineers and scientists, if we can do things to help with uh, democratization of access to healthcare, this is a really important goal. So I'm going to tell you about some of our technology, which I think is uh, hopefully really revolutionizing the way uh, that we can look at diseases in some of these lower income countries. And um, one of the ways that um, we uh, think about this and apply our technology is by uh, in the area of M Health. So thinking about how we could use mobile phones. Um, you obviously are so uh, many of you will be so connected to your mobile phones in terms of using them for social media and web searches. And, and many of you will also be aware that they can be um, also used within the mobile diagnostic space and, and for uh, developing new, new kinds of tests. And, and why is this important? Well, there's seven, in fact, over seven billion um, global mobile phone subscriptions and um, providing tests that can um, be read by mobile, mobile phone is, is a great way of um, democratizing access to healthcare. And I'll, t I'll tell you a little bit more details about that. So, so if you're interested in this topic, um, we, we, we wrote a, 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 a rather long um, piece in, uh, well, a, a full article on this in uh, Nature recently. 
Um, looking at the growth of mobile phones um, across the world, but you can see they're also growing a lot in um, sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and also, it's not just the number of um, smartphones that are growing, it's also their capabilities. So for example, now, um, the, the sort of quality of the cameras and um, also other features that you can have the, with the phone really help us with empowering these M Health approaches. Um, also within this paper, we looked at um, a mapping in Uganda of um, people um, within these communities that were uh, more than five kilometers from a healthcare facility um, um, and, and uh, that could uh, also looked at their mobile phone coverage. And what, what was very striking is that there are many, many people that are too far away from a healthcare facility, but actually would be close enough um, to um, uh, a network that ena would enable them to access uh, healthcare if it could be coupled to mobile phone um, provision. So, so this is really, really, I think, uh, very empowering in terms of um, helping people that wouldn't normally have access to these um, biosensing tests, for example, to access them. There, there's still, still a number of uh, problems with this around digital divide. And if you're interested in that, we discuss that a lot in our, in our paper. Uh, we've set up this center called iSense. I'm currently the deputy director. Um, this was set up several years ago, uh, pre-COVID. Um, and we have people within the center working on tracking of uh, symptoms within a population. Um, my, my research is on the ultra-sensitive biosensing, and then this is all coupled to online care pathways. Uh, the example I'm going to give you is about early HIV detection. And uh, we need it to be uh, early point of care, um, and it, that's very difficult to do. You can normally only do a good point of care um, at the time we started this work. Um, by looking at antibodies in the patient and they only appear after three weeks. So to get to the really acute stage detection, you need to detect the virus itself. Um, in particular, we're interested in this protein called P24, but it's very there in small amounts. And to do that, you need very ultra sensitive biosensing. So we developed um, nanoparticles that could act as artificial enzymes, a little bit like horseradish peroxidase, um, but they're really stable, so they can be used in places like Africa. They can function over large uh, extremes of temperature, um, and they can produce really dramatic um, color changes because of their catalytic activity. And um, some of our uh, best particles are shown in this paper here. They have a gold core and a porous platinum shell. Um, and once um, we use them in our biosensing, they'll uh, produce a very uh, deep, rich color and we can functionalize them with um, uh, antibodies. So, so what we do is to um, take uh, um, samples um, that have P24 um, in them from uh, patient samples, and we can then uh, put our particles in, and we also put in a separate nanobody that has a, a biotin group on the end, and the uh, P24 will get sandwiched between the antibodies on the particle and the nanobody, and then the biotin group on the nanobody will mean that when these particles are run up a, a strip, so this is like a lateral flow based test system, they will bind very quickly to the streptavidin. And you can then um, um, add some chemicals to enable a hundredfold amplification. So you get a really strong amplification of the signal. And you can uh, take pictures of that by mobile phone. This shows some of the quantification here. Um, and it shows you that with this amplification that's there showed in the red um, data points, we get right into that acute stage. And at the time that we produced this um, work, uh, this was the first uh, point of care test that was able to do this. Um, and you can see it vastly outperforms the commercial gold standard for the limit of um, detection. So this is really, really exciting. We're working really closely with uh, collaborators in KwaZulu-Natal in South Africa. Um, you can see the photo on the left from one of our um, visits out there with myself and the, um, uh, my um, colleague, Rachel McKendry. Um, and we are working with uh, rural communities um, uh, out there. This is, um, I'll just skip that video for, for time, but um, we have um, members of ISENSE. This is one of the PhD students from ISENSE, Val, who's uh, spent quite a bit of time out there in uh, working with um, healthcare workers. They've trained over 40 uh, local healthcare workers to read 
uh, tests in the field with um, uh, carriers that have procedural markers and um, Rachel's group has recently just published this in uh, Nature um, Medicine. And the idea is that that um, ability to um, read tests in more reproducible ways and then link them to online pet care pathways can enable patients to get much quicker uh, access to, to care. And uh, the initial work is done with um, more, more standardized tests and, and we're also um, collaborating with the, the newer biosensing tests. And then final um, slide that I want to uh, show you to make sure that I um, stay on time is, is this one here, which is um, a different test that we developed. This was a test that could detect um, which um, strain of Ebola survivors of Ebola had. Uh, this is from the Gulu outbreak um, in Uganda. Um, we looked at a, our, our PhD student went out there with tests that we developed in house um, and was able to distinguish between three different strains of Ebola in about 100, um, 100 or so uh, healthy um, and uh, uh, survivor uh, patients of Ebola and to uh, read these on the mobile phone and generate these geotag maps of, of how the um, outbreak was um, was um, presenting itself and and you know this was you can as you can see it was in 2018 and um, really a kind of a precursor to how useful these kind of approaches would become um, in the current COVID um, pandemic so um, we're really excited about these kind of um, interventions because they, they are low cost and yet they have a sensitivity that uh, really outperforms the more standard biosensing approaches so that we can um, achieve uh, robustness um, and the right kind of interventions for the people who, who need them. So um, I'm just going to finish off by um, just reminding you the different areas I've touched upon, um, talking a little bit about some of our interest in the biomaterial interface and also how we can characterize this, including with the SPARTA um, and, and uh, also on a nano needle and other systems. Um, and then finally, how we can think about developing nanomaterials to enable better um, and more robust and, and cheaper disease detection. And I'd like to finish just by thanking my um, absolutely superb um, research group and all of our collaborators and funders. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Stevens. Uh, just, um, such elegant work. I'm always amazed with your presentations and in particular the fantastic images that you have uh, that really provide uh, very powerful insight, I think, into the biomaterials interface. So thank you so much for that. And I think I can see that Dr. Cullis is on here, so I'm sure he would have really appreciated hearing the kind words um, that you had for him at the beginning of your talk. So thank you for that as well. I can see that there is a hand up and of course it is Peter. So <laughs> please go ahead, Peter. Fantastic. Okay, I just got unmuted. Um, yeah, great talk, Molly. Uh, the um, just a couple of questions. I mean, one was uh, the, the the nano needles, and their uh, they appear to be able to get through the plasma membrane, but maybe not through the nuclear membrane where they seem to be deforming it. I was just wondering if that's uh, could you comment on that in terms of uh, is that what's really happening, or is it something else? Yeah, yeah. I, th I think I think that is happening. So we spent quite a lot of time studying that now. Um, and, and, and when we first started these studies, it was really not clear whether they were kind of piercing the, the plasma main membrane or not. Um, I think it's a sort of frustrated phagocytosis process. So the cell is maybe even trying to eat them a little bit. Um, but, that, but the uh, outer membrane is definitely there, but it's more permeable. So you can get stuff through. Now the nuclear membrane um, does not get um, ruptured, but um, it does slightly change the ratio of the different um, uh, lamins within the nuclear membrane. And we have a paper on that. Actually, Katie Hansel's paper looks at that. Um, and what we found is that there are also some very slight epigenetic changes in the cells that seem to influence um, the ability to reprogram cells. And that actually it, it helps us have a slightly easier job at reprogramming cells. So we're kind of using that to our advantage. But I guess they're just, um, um, in terms of evolution, it, it makes sense that the, the cell would want to kind of conserve, conserve more of the integrity of that inner nuclear membrane. Yeah, I, I the, um, what your comments about the, um, 
you know, we still got some plasma membrane there. You know, obviously, I, I'm fascinated by what happens in the endosome. Do you think it could be used as a probe? What's happening in endosomes? Um, so um, we've, we're really interested in studying that. Um, it's not super easy to study, but we have a, we have a couple people in the group at the moment um, using actually slightly different types of imaging to look at that um, and, to, and, and actually to study in general um, trafficking of um, uh, other kinds of nanoparticles into um, endosomes. Because I agree with you, it's kind of um, you know, just a, a really interesting area. And, and in fact, in my lab, my satellite lab in Sweden, we have a 10-year a program that's dedicated to, to studying that question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Does anyone else have any questions? Oh, we've got a question here in the... Uh... Congratulations on your talk. Do you consider working... Uh, have you considered working on the detection of breast cancer? That's one of the questions that we have here, Molly. Yeah, we have a really great um, collaboration with Charles Coombs um, on breast cancer. Um, in particular, actually, um, not, not so much early detection, but um, in patients that have had breast cancer, they've had it treated. Um, and we're then interested in looking at recurrence. Um, so we're looking at early detection of recurrence, and that's with... Um, professor, a clinician called Charles Coombs and also uh, Jackie Shaw. That's fantastic. Thank you. And then one more question here. Uh, thank you for the great talk again. Is there some way, is it Sparta or Sparta A? I'm not sure how to say that, but could be employed for the quantification of peptide ligands attached to the surface of, surface of lipid nanoparticles, for example. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. That, that, that's something we're really, really interested in. So if you're interested in that, please, please get in touch. Yeah. Wonderful. So we can see an opportunity potentially for a collaboration there. Thank you. Um, and I, I don't know if there are any other questions, but maybe just um, one of the things that we talked a little bit, I think we're all interested in, in the impact of COVID-19 uh, on research in general. And you, we talked a little bit about this before everyone joined today. Can you talk to us a little bit Sounds as though you've just been going ahead full steam during this time, which doesn't surprise me because you're such an amazing, amazing person. There's nothing that can kind of hold you back. Um, but maybe just talk a little bit about how COVID has impacted you and your research team. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely say I have an amazing team. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, I mean, I mean, for us, um, I, I think what we were able to do and and what there was a huge motivation to do was to see how we could apply some of the skill sets that we already had within the group to be helpful within the pandemic. So we have um, actually got very far in the development of diagnostics that are helpful for COVID that have a much more ultra sensitive uh, threshold for detection than the currently available diagnostics. And uh, that's currently being commercially developed as well. I, I didn't speak about that um, uh, today, but we've also, um, uh, been been working um, on on some of the more therapeutic ab approaches as well to to see about um, things like virus neutralization and, and and we work also a little bit within the vaccine hub at um, Imperial College. So it was it was very striking to me that um, as soon as the, the pandemic really um, reached uh, kind of um, the situation in the UK where we the, the country went into lockdown that so many people in my group um, actually stepped forward and, and were very active still in the lab and okay. really pushing, I, I mean, so motivating, right? Just a, such a fantastic group of um, early career researchers. So um, for us, it's been um, uh, a, a really a, a chance to kind of push a lot of the research forward as well. Um, and, and do this alongside what's been, you know, a very difficult kind of personal situation for many people. But, but I think uh, science-wise, it's been a period of huge uh, growth. Absolutely fantastic to hear. Maybe one last question. Uh, thank you for sharing your wide-ranging research initiatives. In your opinion, which approach or combinations of approaches to drug delivery and or detection hold the most promise? for transformative therapeutic impact over the next decade? And how disruptive might such impacts be relative to some of the existing uh, therapeutic or diagnostic approaches? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, 
it, it, there's sort of different ways of thinking about that question. So um, some of the work I see as being more underpinning and more fundamental and other work is, is very, very applied. So for example, the Sparta technology, which we're just about to um, spin out into a, a company and has really gone very far in the development, I think can be can be really transformative, not just for our work, right, but for the whole field in terms of understanding how people can make better medicines and safer medicines and really understanding processes, for example, like corona formation, you know, these um, kind of study study of really fundamental uh, things that can have really big functional um, outcomes. So um, I think, I think uh, you know, it's like which of your children's your favorite children, right? I like, <laughs> I like uh, you know, very, Great. very strongly in, in all the things we do, but, but, but they're just a bit different in that some are more fundamental and some are really clearly very, very applied. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for delivering the September 2021 Peter Cullis Invitational Lecture. Just absolutely brilliant lecture and you're always so inspiring. Uh, so thank you uh, and all and also a big thank you to today's uh, participants. Thank you for joining us.